Okay, now in this session, we'll be focusing on the hallmarks of scientific research. The hallmarks or most main or most distinguishing characteristics of scientific research. So there are eight hallmarks of research. Purposiveness, rigor, testability, replicability, precision and confidence, objectivity, generalizability, and parsimony. Now, each of these characteristics can be explained in the context of concrete example. Now, let us discuss each of these hallmarks of scientific research. The first one is purposiveness. So your research should be purposefully So your research should be based on definite aim and purpose. So without a definite aim or purpose, there is no point of conducting a research, whether it's basic research or whether it's applied research. Your research should have a definite purpose. For instance, there is a problem uh, with your uh, organization. The sales are going down or maybe the people are leaving the organization. Now, when you are thinking of this problem and you start conducting research, there should be a definite purpose. Okay, I want to find out why the sales are going down, why the people are leaving the organization, why the organization performance is deteriorating. So you need to find out, you need to have a definite purpose for your research. Once you identify that, okay, this is the definite purpose of my research. This is what I want to do. The next step is rigor. Now, a good theoretical base and a sound methodological design add rigor to your purposive study. Rigor connotes carefulness and identifying, okay, this is how I'm going to achieve my purpose. So you need to have both theoretical foundation, that the variables that you are using in your study, the relationship that you are studying in or evaluating in your study, they should have a thorough, a clear theoretical foundation. Without a proper theoretical foundation, without a proper theoretical base, without any proper literature, your study will not have rigor. So you need to identify what are the theoretical foundations on which you are or, or, or on which you base your relationship. In the case of our example, let's say the manager of an organization asked 10 to 12 of its employees to indicate what would increase their level of commitment to it. If solely on the basis of their responses, the manager reaches several conclusions on how employee commitment can be increased, the whole approach to investigation is unscientific. It lacks rigor. Why does it lack rigor if you only base your assumption on these 12 employees? The conclusion are incorrectly drawn because they are based on the response of just few employees. So there is a methodological problem. There could be 10,000 employees, 5,000 employees, 1,000 employees. So you need to have a representative sample in your study. For instance, you say uh, you're studying conflict in organization and you say that toss conflict negatively impacts project performance. But this shows that you haven't studied the literature in detail because there is literature available that says that task conflict can also positively impact the the performance of the project workers or the performance of the project so rigor has to do, has has to do with both the theoretical foundation and the methodological design of your study now next is testability now, once you have identified that, okay, this is the purpose of my research. The second is you have identified, okay, this is how I'm, I'm going to study my relationship. This is why these relationships exist. And these are the methodological concentrations, considerations that I've taken into account. This is how I'm measuring my variables. This is how I'm going to analyze my variables. The next step is you have to make sure that, what, that these hypothesis or the hypothesis that, that you propose are testable. Testability is a prop property that applies to the hypothesis of this study. Your hypothesis should be both predictable and testable. You should be able to predict a, a, the, hypo the results of the hypothesis and you should be able to test your hypothesis as well. Let's say we've got this hypothesis. 
in this study, we have got this hypothesis, servant leadership has a significant impact on life satisfaction. So I can predict, yes, servant leadership can have an impact on life satisfaction, or let's say servant leadership can have an impact on career satisfaction. So I can say, well, yes, it can impact based on my literature. I can say, yet it can. And now how would I test it? I will collect data on both servant leadership and career satisfaction, and obviously put it in any software, and then it will be able to give me the results that, okay, yes, these two are uh, related with each other or not. Now, the next thing is replicability. Let us suppose that the manager or the researcher, based on the results of the study, conclude that participation in decision making is an important factor to employ commitment. Now, replication demonstrates that our hypothesis have not been supported merely by chance, but are reflected or are reflective of a true state of affairs of the population. And they should be supported again and again if the research is repeated in similar situations. For example, if I'm saying that servant leadership positively impacts career satisfaction, now if I find out, yes, there is a positive relationship, now this positive relationship should be or may be or, or actually if it should be replicated under the similar circumstances. If I'm going to conduct research in education sector, I should expect a similar relationship. So your results are replicated. It should be repeated. And this will give you confidence in your results. The next is precision and confidence. You should have both precision and confidence in your findings. So precision refers to the reality of the, or the closeness of the findings to reality. Now, how do you have a precise uh, or how do you gain precision? It should be based on the sample of your study. So it refers to the accuracy, how accurate your results are or could be. The next thing is confidence, having confidence in your results. This is not merely enough to be precise. You have to be confident in your research or your results. Now, how do you gain confidence when you have got a larger sample size? How do you gain confidence when you have based your measure on proper literature, when you have used the right methodology, when you have assessed the relationship through proper analytical techniques? And then there are confidence interval analytical techniques that we'll be discussing in greater detail later. Uh, we use uh, basically 95% confidence interval. We'll be discussing in the, this in uh, detail later or maybe in other videos as well. The next step is objectivity. The conclusions drawn through the interpretation of the results of the data analysis should be objective. That is, they should be based on facts of the findings derived from the actual data. So you should not hypothesize uh, your results. You should not assume your, your results. You should collect the data and then based on that data, you should obviously objective, as, objectively assess, okay, this is why I'm saying that my hypothesis is supported and this is why I'm saying my hypothesis may not be supported because I've got empirical evidence for this. I've got the data to support my findings. So if I say that servant leadership does have an impact on life satisfaction, I'm not saying this just because of my intuition or my own knowledge. I'm saying this because I've collected data and then tested this data through a particular software or through particular analytical techniques. Generalizability is the next step. Generalizability refers to the scope of applicability of the research finding. Now, there could be a wider generalizability, there could be a limited generalizability. So generalizability would mean, okay, if 10 or 15 people think in this particular manner, manner can I say that 100 people would think in the same manner? Let's say, if there is an organization that has 1000 employees, and I collect only data from maybe 10 or 15 employees, can I say that the whole 1000 employee would think the same way? No because I've got a very limited sample from those 1,000 employees. Those 10 or 15 employees will not be, or the findings from those 10, 15 employees is not generalizable to all the rest of the employees. So for wider generalizability, you need a rigorous sampling design. You need a detailed sampling design. You need a representative, a representative sampling design or sample. So we'll be discussing that in detail in our sampling section. The next is parsimony. So using limited number of factors to explain our outcome. For example, 
let's say if we've got two or three variables that explain uh, a particular outcome and then there are maybe 10 or 15 variables that explain a particular right outcome for instance there are three variables or there be, there are two variables employee satisfaction and employee commitment that explain 45 percent of the change as to why people do not leave the organization and then there are maybe uh, another 10 factors that add only 3% to it. So a parsimonious output would obviously include just these two variables, satisfaction and commitment, because these two are explaining 45% of the change. And we do not need to focus on the rest of the 3% because obviously they are not explaining much change. So parsimony can help us improve the understanding of the models. So using limited number of factors, limited number of variables to explain the output to explain the outcome is called parsimony so this is this is this is all about our uh, our hallmarks of scientific research so let's thank you so, thank you very much for watching uh, or rather listening to me